How's it going, everybody? Is your favorite apostates? I'm McKay. And I'm Jordan. And we're back. Late. Back again. Again. Don't get us copyright claimed. Thank Sorry. you. <laughs> if you were uh, a participant in last week's live stream, you would have heard that we were going to upload a video, an episode on Friday. Um, if you have eyeballs, you probably noticed that you <laughs> didn't see an episode from us on Friday. That would be because we recorded it and I got up to turn off the camera and realized it was not recording <laughs> the whole time. So instead of breaking our equipment and personal items, we decided to <laughs> just skip we the just week. We just gave up. Yeah. Every goddamn planet was in retrograde apparently, so... And if not, then I'm, that's just my truth. We're just, we're making shit up as we go. It's true. So we're coming at you now. Better late than ever, right? Right, Jordan? Right. <laughs> we're just gonna, we're gonna send it. We're doing it over. We have some time, last time it was kind of rushed because we had to do it after Jordan got home from work, but today we don't have to wait for Jordan to get home from work because she didn't have work today. Anyway, let's get into it. I'm going to turn it over to Jordan because she was the big proponent behind this topic. Today, we are talking about the Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. And I'll get into why in a moment. But if you are new here, the nice thing about watching this video, if you are not Mormon, is that we are ex-Mormon. We left the church. Um, we resigned before we were going to be kicked and are here today to live to tell the tale. And so we give perspective on Mormon, Mormon adjacent influencers. And so we have a unique perspective on the Real Housewives of Salt Lake City because we are former Mormons and Hell yeah. lifelong Mormons. So we also live on Wasatch Front. So we do. I lived in Salt Lake City for a few years. We're not far from Salt Lake City now. And so yeah. we're deep in Utah culture. Yep. Not that, I mean, we didn't grow up here, but, and the, the setting doesn't necessarily play the biggest factor in uh, the Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, just the population and everything. Geography, it's, it's hard to watch the show, I'm going to be honest, mainly because anytime they go anywhere, I'm trying to figure out where it is. Like all the B-roll and stuff. That we can right a lot the of the time. Breaks. Yeah, a lot of times we know where they're at. and It's pretty, pretty strange because, I mean, living in Denver and in Salt Lake, you don't really get that kind of stuff a lot. Mm -hmm. Unless you uh, watch Hallmark movies, then you'll recognize a lot of areas in Davis County, Utah, because they it's do true. a lot of filming for uh, Hallmark movies there, it's which true. is really strange. So, anywho... When we started out on TikTok, we, as soon as Real Housewives of Salt Lake City came on the scene, we got asked about it constantly. Oh, all the time. All the time. People were like, do you watch it? Do you watch it? Do you watch it? I'd love to hear you talk about it. And we never did. And Well, and you're not like a big particular in any of the housewives. No, I've genre, only seen right? like certain things maybe when I was in college and I watched them with my sisters when I was in a sorority, but... <clears throat> and I... I mean, point blank, do not care about the drama of rich people. But, so so. The, the thing is, is I love reality shows. I live for drama. The problem is, is I get sucked in and then I like <laughs> shirk all my responsibilities because I want to watch the show. And because I work and I'm in grad school, I can't do that. So I tend to not watch these things because then I get distracted and don't do any of the things I'm supposed to do. But... For you guys, bless your hearts, I have embraced that and have been shirking my responsibilities in order to bring this content to you. I have kept her on track, don't worry. <laughs> and there are consequences to my actions, but I am here nonetheless. So, we're going to get into it. We're not going to really give a synopsis of the whole season right now. We're just going to give a rundown. Uh, we've watched almost through season two at this point. Um, 
but we'll just give a rundown of who these people are and kind of the interesting dynamics that exist within the show before we even start talking about the events and the goings-ons of the real Housewives of Salt Lake City. So since a lot of you don't watch this, but I assume you're going to find it interesting, I figured we would do an intro on who the players are, a video on season one, a video on season two, maybe two videos for season two because it's long, and then a video going forward for season three. And so... Season three is going on right now, so depending on when that's finished up, we'll get there correct so that's the plan for right now um but if you don't watch it you need to know who the hell the people are so that's where we're going to start today first things first we are starting with the biggest pot stirrer of the drama of the show in my one of the one of the biggest personalities oh for sure the most vocal yeah which is a good and, and bad thing for sure is jen shaw the Jen Shaw. So the one and only. The one and only. So as you watch our videos and as we get through the different seasons, she will always be a topic of conversation. We've actually talked about her before on one of our previous streams. Um, so <laughs> let's get into the details about these people so you've got the background. So Jen Shaw is one of the Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. I took notes on all of these things so i have a list but i wrote all these things down because i felt it was important she is hungarian italian irish chinese tongan and hawaiian a lot but that's important so i wanted to include all those things she talks a lot about her um like tongan culture yeah her heritage and yeah really big emphasis on family and that's like a a huge plot point for her throughout everything that we've seen thus far. Yes. So Jen is the oldest of six kids. Um, She talks about in the show how her dad actually came to the U.S. from Tonga in order to provide a better life um, for their family. And so you can tell she has a lot of respect um, for for family just in general. Um, Her dad did pass away during, I think it was during, maybe before, the first season, which is a contention point um, in the show. But her mom is still around and you see her more as the season goes along. But she um, met her husband, Sharif, in um, college. And they got married in 1994. So Jen grew up a Mormon. Their family was Mormon. And Sharif was not Mormon, so they married. He's um, Muslim. Muslim. I couldn't think of the word. Got too many religions going on in this show. <laughs> um, Ironically enough, for real. We'll get on with that later, but for real. So they got married. Doesn't sound like religion was like a huge contention point. Um, they just got married, and in 1994, and then five years into their marriage, she was like, you know, Sharif, why don't you convert to Mormonism? Like, it's great, and we have all these things, and we love it, and it's family oriented, yeah, and all this stuff, and beautiful. Why not? And so. Five years in, she says that, and he was like, are you serious? They didn't even let black people join the church until, like, the 1970s. And I don't think she knew that. At least that's the vibe that came off to Is that how he referred it? Yes. Just a a point of clarification, he is referring to the ban on black men holding the priesthood and entering the temple along with black women not being able to enter the temple since women can't hold a priesthood regardless. So that's what he's referring to. Racism is deeply entrenched within Mormonism. If you've watched some of our videos, you've probably gathered that by now, but there is a lot of deep rooted racism, even within like the church doctrine. It's not just a cultural thing, but there very is very much is a cultural role. Um, but there also is a really big uh, population of Tongan, Hawaiian, Asian American, Pacific Islander yeah. people here in Utah. Um, and then in Tonga specifically that I can think of that is very, very, very predominantly Mormon. Yeah, there were huge missionary efforts in all of the Pacific Islands. So I, 
outside of Utah, I think Donga has one of the highest percentages, like the highest concentration of Mormons than anywhere else on the planet. So it's kind of interesting. I mean, there is kind of, obviously I'm not really familiar with the indigenous beliefs of any of the, um, the people of the Pacific islands, but I, from what I have learned from just the, the Tongan and the Samoan people that I've met, um, throughout my years, it seems like there's a huge emphasis on family and on heritage, which, and tradition, which are really big things in the Mormon church as well. So I can definitely see the appeal. Some compatibility there. And compatibility. Something I did want to note was, I mean, if they got married when they were in, they were in college, right, in 94. Mm -hmm. So they were like 20 to 22 years old, maybe 24 at the oldest. Like, that's basically the amount of time since the priesthood ban was lifted. And Jen didn't even know about it. That was only like 20 years, right? Yeah. That's wild to think that even in the span of 20 years, it was just swept down the memory hole. Yeah. And nobody was talking about it. Whereas, like, I mean, even 20 years after that, I didn't really know about the priesthood ban. Yeah. Um, until, and it definitely wasn't, well, that's my, me being white, didn't ever occur to me as being a problem. Well, and it just generally wasn't talked about about yeah. really a lot, like in definitely the mainstream church more recently. Um, like in recent years, it's been a lot more of a, yeah. of a thing. I think the only time they would ever talk about the priesthood ban would be applauding Ezra Taft, Taft Benson for lifting it. Other than that, if you that year's topic wasn't the teachings of Ezra Taft Benson, you probably never talked about it. Five years in, she tells him that he's like they wouldn't let black people in the church. And so they have two kids. And so obviously, you know, her kids are half black. And so when she had that conversation with Sharif, she said that that basically started her questioning process. And ultimately, she came to the conclusion that I can't be a part of a religion that doesn't accept like my husband, my family, my kids. Um, and so that's kind of her way out of the church. Um, she doesn't ever specifically say if she resigned or anything, but they are definitely not Mormon anymore. And then she converted to Islam. So, and they currently practice, I don't know how much, yeah. how often, but it is mentioned more in season two, but um, yeah, so. Yeah, you almost don't get any of it in season one. Not really, no. So a little bit of background on Sharif, just because I think it's important. Um, he actually played for the University of Utah from 1990 to 1993. Oh, I wonder why you think that's important, Jordan. <laughs> my alma mater for my undergraduate degree, I'm currently there again for my master's, so I am a little biased. Um, he currently is a coach at the University of Utah. So he's special teams coordinator and cornerbacks coach. He was hired in 2012 by Kyle Whittingham, who was head coach um, of the Utes at the time. And he was the coach while I was there. Anyway. Anyway. Watch out. So he had, he played for the Utes when he was in college, had a career ending neck injury during his senior year, I believe it was. And so he had to quit playing football at that point. And so interestingly, and this isn't really talked much on the show, but interestingly, he went and got his juris doctorate and practiced law for 12 years. So that's not really a talking point in the show which at all, weird. which is kind of bizarre. Yeah. I don't know. I get the vibe. He's just like a super humble guy. Yeah. Super cool, in my opinion, just from what I've seen Yeah. on the show. Very low key, very humble. Um, and so that's kind of Sharif's role. And so he spends a lot of time recruiting. And so he is gone, at least in the first season, he's gone a lot, which has implications for their marriage that kind yeah. of plays out in season one and two. Um, and so that's Sharif. That's kind of their relationship. They are rich as all get out. I mean, the photos of their home. Holy shit. Holy shit. Crazy. The amount of money is just truly unbelievable. Um, crazy, crazy. Just to, to prove a point about how I perceive Sharif as being like humble, just really laid back. 
Jen drives a Porsche Panamera that is like brand new. And Sharif drives like a 2000s Land Cruiser or Sequoia or something, <laughs> like early 2000s. <laughs> and when I saw that, I was like, I like this guy. <laughs> so the thing about Jen also is she owns her own like marketing type lead company. Um, she, in other interviews, it was either, I don't remember which season it was, she talked about kind of being the Wizard of Oz, like working behind the scenes in marketing and connecting people like with leads and things, which plays out not so positively later on. Um, but <laughs> yeah. that's what she does. And you don't see a lot of it in the show. They don't really talk much about what she does. Um, she has like eight assistants in the first season, eight assistants who are constantly everywhere, yeah. including Stuart, who's her number one assistant. And so, She's got a whole team, like a whole team working for her at any given moment. So they call it the Shaw Squad. The Shaw Squad. And so they are definitely rich, rich. That's for damn sure. And they live up in Park City, which is like, um, if you're familiar with Colorado, it's like the Utah version of Vail. So the very rich, rich area. I think by most all the people from slopes. the United States are familiar with Vail. Probably. I might just be stupid. Also... I have a hell of a f nod back here. <laughs> Don't look. <laughs> Go ahead. Anyway, so that's where they live. They have a big old house up there. Next on the list is Heather. Heather Gay. Yes, that is her last name. Heather has my heart and soul. I love her so much. I did not think I would like any of the personalities on this show. <laughs> But Heather is just, she's, she's genuine. Real. She's yeah. real. Like, you can tell she really stands out as the person who's, like, more down to earth and normal, if you will. Um, but she's hilarious, and I absolutely love her. And I actually have talked to her, and she now follows us on Instagram. So let's go. Stay tuned. Um, anyway. Yeah, there might be something there. <clears throat> just, just saying. Just saying. Anyway, so they talk about, you know, we should, probably should have said this in the beginning, but I did not know how deeply embedded Mormonism was going to be in the show. I did not know. People had brought it up, but I wasn't sure how much yeah. it would play a role. And, like, obviously it takes place in Salt Lake City, and you think, oh, well, of course it's going to have, like, Mormonism. It's all over Salt Lake City, but, man... But it's they literally, it's literally dropped within like the first 15 seconds of the intro in the very first episode of the show. Yeah. Like Mormonism is generally at the heart of like a lot of it. Like there's constant B-roll footage of the Salt Lake City Temple, which is where we got married, all kinds of other temples in Utah. Like it, Mormonism is brought up a lot. Oh yeah. So it is a really big proponent of the show. So in the introduction to Heather... In the first episode, she starts out by saying that perfection is attainable through Mormonism, which is a very common attitude yeah. amongst Mormon women, especially, that you have to be put together, that you, you know, everybody puts on a face, you look beautiful all the time, and you have these perfect kids and the perfect husband and the perfect marriage, and everything is just perfect all of the time. Well, it's even kind of like an extension of the core beliefs of Mormonism that you can be an exalted being like they believe God to be. Correct. So it, it just goes to show that the it these kinds of beliefs kind of bleed into all aspects of life. And per perfection even goes on to being perfection of appearance and things like that, or perfection of what people um, assume to be the beauty standard and things like that. Yeah. And so Heather Gay did all of the things right. Um, she was the perfect Mormon by all standards. She had a lot of siblings. I don't remember how many, but she came from a big Mormon family. Um, she actually grew up in Colorado. So did we. We learned in season two. Yeah. Um, she also went on a mission to France, I believe. Yep, south of France is what she said. And when she 
when she went on a mission, it was not as common for women to go on missions because she was 21, I believe, when she went. And at that time in kind of Mormon culture, women went on missions if they weren't married by that point. Yeah, there was, I, and I think she she's probably a little younger than my parents were, but there was always this perception of women missionaries, sister missionaries, being on a mission because they were too ugly to get married. Yeah. Which is... It's just fucking ridiculous. Yeah. Just misogyny to the extreme. <laughs> just toxic because Heather is a beautiful person inside and out. Anyway, so she did all the things right. She's purebred Mormon as she refers to it. She has pioneer ancestors that settled in Utah. So, I mean, the girl is Mormon like through and through. Um, so then she goes on to get married to um, a Mormon man. They go on to have three daughters. She marries into the gay family, last name gay family, not a gay family. <laughs> um, she marries into the gay family. We love gay families. And I was not aware of them. We haven't been in Utah for like the longest time, but apparently the gay family is considered like Mormon royalty and they are worth billions with a B. And so she married into that family, so good on her. She married into she married into some money. They have three kids. She plays by all the rules. She does everything right. She goes to church. She, you know, by all accounts, she is the ideal Mormon. So then things happen. I don't want to get into too much because of what we're going to talk about in the subsequent subsequent seasons. But she ends up getting separated and then divorced. She talks about in the show how divorce is not an option um, in Mormonism. And some people will argue, I'm sure there will be TBMs in the comments that will argue about whether or not that's true. But is divorce happening in the church more often now? Probably. Is it more public now? Also probably. But the thing is, in my opinion, from a cultural standpoint, still there's a lot of shame tied to divorce. Yeah. Like, it's still not, like, there's still a lot of shame and stigma. Like, oh, what did you do? You didn't pray hard enough. Yeah. You didn't go to church enough. You didn't oh, go to the temple enough. He's addicted to porn. Yeah. Or, you know, she stepped out on him. She stepped something. out. They had an affair. The, the mind runs wild yeah. when the ward catches wind. Seriously. And I don't think she ever addressed the why, and I don't blame her because... That's not necessary. That's not necessary. You gotta justify it. But nonetheless, I see her absolute pain for... She also talks about how she was the only Mormon woman in her family to get divorced. Yeah. And so... We're, we're not even talking... She mentioned that it wasn't just, like, living family. Like, in generations of family, she was the only one. So you could tell she felt really, really heavy about getting yeah. divorced. And you can tell she felt really guilty um, especially towards her, her daughters about it. Her daughters are all teenagers now, um, at least. And so they're all older yeah, and probably have a deeper understanding. But as far as by profession, I was really kind of, it was nice to see in the show, like, because all the other personalities in the show are rich as hell and have like these insane expensive houses and heather's house is like it's still really nice like don't yeah. get me wrong but it's very modest compared to the other women on the show and so it was really encouraging to see that because she gives like that humble i don't need to live in like an 18 bedroom house kind of vibe you know and so i appreciated that but she is now after being uh, you know, Mormon moms stay in the home. That's be the expectation for so long. She is now a super successful businesswoman. Um, hell yeah. Hell yeah. She started Beauty Lab and Laser, um, which is like a, they do all kinds of things. It's like medical spa type where they do like facials and like esthetician type face treatments. Yeah. That kind of stuff. And then they do like cosmetic surgery, um, like Botox, lip fillers, um, you know, but just like injections, not like yeah. implants, not like, like surgery like or like, yes. anything extensive like that. But the thing about Utah is, and I'll have McKay throw up the statistic because I can never remember it, but 
Salt Lake City is actually like the place with the most amount of plastic surgery. Like it's like second behind LA. I'm pretty confident. I'll have to look. So if it's per capita, I could see it definitely, maybe even rivaling or topping LA. Yeah, LA I would imagine has the most because of population and size. But so just think about that for a minute, like. Plastic surgery and cosmetic procedures and shit in Utah yeah. is like next fucking level. Like it is just like the descendants of hand cart pioneers are getting plastic surgery at an alarming rate. Yeah, I, and there's nothing wrong with yeah, it. No. We don't have any maybe shade. Isn't the, the word to use it, but no. And there's like if that's what you want to do, full support. Yeah, like I've got it. therapist lines in my forehead at my age and that's just not right so maybe i should go get botox like there isn't anything wrong with it but i can't think of many more profitable in like industries to throw yourself into in this state because holy shit and so she talks a lot about how their target market and their demographic is mormon women and they have like a really modest looking location that's not like stu like super like intimidating intimidating and like luxury and like very high end it's like and it's not that it's not high end it's just like it takes the intimidation factor out of it of like i don't know do you know what i'm saying yeah no it's like um it's it's more palatable for a lot of a lot of people because yeah. i don't know uh, when you're looking at that demographic particularly it runs the gamut there's a lot of different mormon people out there that it's not just one little typecast as yeah. we see on this obviously there are some boxes that they need to fit into because of the requirements of living the commandments and everything like that but yeah it's like uh going to we've talked about this with tattoos it's like going to the tattoo parlor as opposed to going to your esthetician who also does tattoos like mm -hmm. it just seems a little more accessible yeah i guess yeah and so uh, you know i've got m a lot of respect for her because she went from like these really strict mormon standards about you know being at home not working and that kind of being imposed on her to going and running this i think now multi-million dollar business yeah and it's hers like she she has a partner but she's ran it and there's multiple locations now and it's like a crave cookies of like designer procedures <laughs> yeah it's amazing i love it i love Not it crumble f crumble <laughs> <laughs> and so she literally in the show she's like it's putting your hand in a river of money that's getting into like the cosmetic industry with fillers and botox and yeah shit like more power to her do it i love it so at the end of kind of her little intro in the first episode, she talks about how all the things that she gravitates to are in alliance with good women, with good Mormon women. So she talks about like, you know, drinking and the stuff in the word of wisdom and gay people and like all the stuff that she's always like wanted to do or found herself drawn to are not things that are aligned with good Mormon women. And so... I don't know if that was in her from the very beginning, but at least in the show, she started, she kind of was at a point where she started to recognize that. And I know there's things that happen with Heather, particularly as the show goes on, but in the first season, we'll kind of talk about her faith transition. Cause that's primarily when it happens. As soon as she said that, and we were going into it, like understanding that she had a faith transition and all this stuff. But uh, as soon as she said that, we were like, that's exactly what all future ex-Mormons say. <laughs> it's sort of a matter of time. And you I just get, get the vibe. Yeah, I get that can be kind of disrespectful towards people's face and, and everything. But at one point or another, you have two wolves inside of you. <laughs> and you have to choose at some point, especially if they're conflicting, which one is more important, which value is more important to you. And... Those things are, uh, and some of those things are really important social issues that just do not work with Mormonism. So it's a lot of times just a matter of time to see how long you can rationalize being a part of an organization that goes in con in contradiction to your core values. Yeah. We were right with uh, 
Amber, Amber Filler, Filler Up Clark. Clark. Good on you, Amber. <laughs> Shout out. Here for it. So then we move on to next is Meredith Marks. We don't have a lot on Meredith, and I don't want to give too much away because she's kind of the quiet one in season one. Um, I call her Switzerland in season one because she very much is like the kind of neutral party yeah. for everyone. And she's like good at staying out of the drama, at least at first. <laughs> that doesn't really last. But Meredith Marks, um, she is not from Utah. She's actually from Chicago. She talks about how she is Jewish. So another not Mormon on the show. Yeah. Very encouraging. Um, they ended up moving to Utah from Chicago for her husband's work like around seven years ago. So they haven't been in Utah for very long. Um, at this point, after... Um, that's seven years at the time of filming season, season one. At mm -hmm. this point, it's been like 10. Yeah. So. Yeah. So her and her husband have three children that are all adults in their 20s now at this point. Um, they've been married for 24 years. So they've been married for a long time. And Meredith owns a store slash jewelry design type business. Um, her store, her physical store is actually in Park City, like we just talked about earlier. Um, and she sells jewelry and designer clothes and things big of money. that nature. Big money, things I couldn't afford. Um, but she talks about how her jewelry business has like a big celebrity following, like she mentioned, like a few popular celebrities, like I think Charlie's their own and like a few others. And so she makes good money. You found out in later in season two, as far as by profession, she actually has a law background. Um, she's not a practicing lawyer, nor has she ever been, but she is a licensed lawyer. So she went to law school. So another Dang. interesting little tidbit that I did not know about Meredith. So she's kind of the non-controversial one, I feel like, to start. Yeah. At least in the beginning. So that's Meredith. She's a little bit less complex because of the nature of season one and not being Mormon. So there is that. She was another one that was not quite a Heather, but a personality that I, I was cool with. Yeah. Now we have Lisa. Now. Instant bad vibes. Instant bad vibes. Instant. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. We are obviously biased because we're ex-Mormons, okay? So I get that there's a level of bias there. It was there. bad vibes before she said that she was Mormon, yeah. honestly. I mean, I agree. But, you know, we also take into account that these are reality TV shows. Are there elements that are scripted? Is there elements that yeah. are edited and played up and totally, absolutely. But Lisa definitely comes off as the villain on the show under Jen. Like, Jen comes off as the primary villain, and then we have Lisa, who's, like, the more, there like, manipulative ones. Lisa's quiet about it, though. Jen's like, what the fuck's wrong with you? And Lisa's like behind her back being like trying to be buddy buddy with the person that she was just talking shit about. Yeah. So like that's the difference generally kind of between the two of them. But if you get Lisa worked up, then she says up shit. But there is this kind of brand <laughs> of Mormon right now that's becoming more popular. It's like Mormon 2.0. Like there are these Mormons that aren't really following the rules of Mormonism, but still say they're Mormon. Which why? It's like this new version of being nuanced. Yeah. Cause for a long time it was called being a new nu nuanced Mormon. Yeah. Or a progmo, a progressive prog Mormon. Yeah, progressive Mormon. So it's like, why there's a lot of negative connotations surrounding the label mm -hmm. why are you clinging to it honestly yeah is it just because of tradition and you're that's how your family you're af afraid to face your family which i can understand for me it wasn't an issue but like why yeah i don't get it anyway so background on lisa she didn't grow up in any kind of religion. Um, she declares that she's Jewish by heritage, Mormon by choice. So 
her family actually actually ended up being converts to Mormonism. Her mom, I guess, had like a relationship with some kind of higher power with a god, and then the Mormon missionaries knocked on their door one day, yeah. and they fell right into it. So, more uh, missionaries would call that a she. She said she was praying for them mm-hmm. when they knocked on her door. And missionaries would consider that to be a golden golden investigator because she instantly was like, this is what I've been looking for and just joined. Yep. So she then met her husband through her older sister because they went on a mission together. Um, The way she talks about it in the later season, it sounds like there might have even been some contention between her and her sister about her relationship with her husband. So I don't know if there was like some sketchy shit that went on there, but her husband, Lisa's husband is like mid. I'm just he like, <laughs> he's just mellow. Like he just kind of exists because Lisa's like Very... bouncing all over the walls and he's just like vibing. Yeah. She's very driven and very, outspoken and uh brutal i would say yes yes so they've been married for 16 years and they now have two kids and the reason that i think for a lot of people that lisa is so controversial is because of her job situation so she owns a luxury marketing company and she does a lot of work at um with sundance the film festival that happens here in Park City. It's kind of like the only celebrity thing that we have here in Salt Lake City that puts Utah on the map. Other than being run by Mormons, we've got Sundance. We've got Sundance, that's that's it. it. (laughs) So she's really involved in that. And then she and her husband own multiple liquor brands. So if you remember... Tequila, particularly. So if you remember anything about Mormonism, you know that drinking is against the rules. There is no wiggle room around drinking. There is no, well, you can have, you know, champagne on New Year's. There, none of that. Mm-hmm. None That's whatsoever. That's absolute. You will get uh, formal discipline from your bishop if you confess to breaking the word of wisdom. So there's no wiggle room on alcohol. So they own multiple liquor brands. And she talks about, I'm sure Mormons care about the fact that I own a tequila brand. And I mean, yeah, it is kind of like, yeah, controversial. I mean, to who do be, you think you are, Brigham Young? You don't have that kind of privilege yet, lady. To be profiting off an industry <laughs> that Mormons don't participate in, like it just is kind of controversial. Like, do I personally give a shit? No, not at all. But as a Mormon, I would have. Like, it is yeah. kind of bizarre. Plus, it's just like you go under the impression initially that they have this liquor these like multiple liquor brands and they don't drink and so it's like how do you not test your own product yeah but then in later seasons you realize that they do drink both of them her and her husband actually drink so how mormon is that did they ever expressly say because i remember at one point heather saying oh you don't even taste your own product or whatever and i don't know if that was as like a kind of a dig at her because she's really Mormon and uptight or something like that, or if that was actually true. I don't know if it was during the first season, but second season she was drinking. Because I don't remember seeing her drinking at all during the first season. Maybe not. So maybe they just quietly started to feel comfortable enough to do it. Maybe. Which, more power to you. I don't think anybody should be governing what you're putting in your own body. Like, But if we're talking from the Mormon perspective, that's not Mormon behavior. Not at all. No. And for being Mormon and identifying yourself as such, it's not really Mormon. Plus, she doesn't wear garments. Mormon underwear? Yeah. None to be seen. Which is ironic because Lisa is the most Mormon one on the show. Mm Mm-hmm. Hands down. Hands down. And she does not wear garments at all. Her outfits are not compatible with garments in any way, shape, or form. Like, probably 95% of the time when she's not wearing, like, sweats. The other thing about Heather that I wanted to add is she is technically still sealed to her husband. Um, We have a video on the sealing ordinance if you're confused, but it is the Mormon marriage ceremony where you get basically attached to the rest of each other, like to each other for eternity, like well beyond your life here. And if you get divorced civilly, like 
and you don't cancel your sealing, you're still sealed. So technically, Heather is still sealed to yep. her first husband, as far as I know. And just to reiterate, like canceling a sealing is not something that you normally do because no. it has to go through the top, the first presidency, like of the entire church. So it's really hard to do. So a lot of people yeah. don't do it. And usually you have to have a reason like you are going to be sealed to another person. Yeah. A new, your new spouse that you're, you're getting remarried or whatever. Mm -hmm. But other than that, they don't grant um, dissolutions of sealings for just any reason. I think if you get excommunicated, you're kind of implied mm -hmm. uh, your sealing is done. But other than that, there's there's no reason to. Yeah. And so I think because of that, I assume Lisa is, because that's how she talked about marriage being eternal, and she talked about ceilings, yeah. but that's in season one anyway. But I also included this screenshot of their kids in the car with them with the crumble box. Everybody say it together. Fuck crumble. So, Lisa. That's the kiss of death right there. So they are also very rich, like rich, 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 rich. Um, I don't know. B throw it in the comments. They own the one that they talk about most is Vita Tequila that mm -hmm. they own. I've never seen this at the liquor store. So if you're familiar, and so at least it's not noticeable to me. But is this some a product that they have in other places? Let me know if you've ever heard of it. Drop it in the comments. Okay, next we have Whitney. God bless her. She's up there with Heather for me. She's cool. She's she, cool. I think she's the youngest of everybody. She is. She's the closest to my age. Yeah. Um, Whitney starts out the show by talking about how she isn't Mormon anymore, but she was. So... She comes from basically Mormon pioneer heritage as well. Her fourth great grandfather was Shadrach Roundy, who's a big name in Mormonism because he was a bodyguard to Joseph Smith. He is also related to Shadrach Roundy. That makes Whitney and I cousins. It also makes Whitney and Heather cousins because they also share that ancestor. So it's quite possible that you are related to Heather as well. Is, was Heather related to him too? Whitney and her cousins for some reason. But it could be like she has him on her maternal side i guess it could be something yeah, like that know. you have to ask her message her <laughs> say hey are you a descendant of shadrach roundy too because family in utah <laughs> everybody generally that's mormon yeah. is related in some way yeah uh, polygamy polygamous communities tend to do that <laughs> yeah and that's no shade because we both come from polygamous ancestry. Like yeah. half of my ancestors that are Mormon were polygamous and they're all over the Salt Lake City Cemetery. And it's like my one great, 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 great uncle and like 15 of his wives around his headstone. So like <laughs> no shade. That's just it that's is just what it is. is. It is what it is. So Whitney grew up Mormon. Um, she is not Mormon anymore because... I love this for her. So she was married prior to her current husband. So she fell in love with a man that she worked with who was also a married. They Maybe were both Maybe Spencer married. was right. We were just talking about ladies in the workplace. Men will give them that attention that they miss out from their husband. Maybe. Spencer, you dirty dog. So. Just kidding. F*** that guy. They were both Mormon, her, Whitney, and her current husband, Justin. They were both married to other people. They fell in love and started having an affair. Um, so that didn't end well, right? And so they decided to stay together. They both split from their partners um, and get divorced and then get married to each other. When they got married, Whitney was five months pregnant, and she said that she was wearing, I think, her high school prom dress, I think. Which, I mean, five months pregnant and wearing your prom dress? That's pretty impressive. That is pretty impressive. I'm not even pregnant, and I couldn't fit my ass in my prom dress, so, I mean, <laughs> more power to you. Dude, I couldn't even fit into our my wedding suit. I couldn't fit into my wedding dress. Are you kidding? 
I was a skinny bitch. So anyway, that happens. They get married. There's a lot of family controversy around that because, you know, Mormons clutch pearls at just about anything. So an affair and their age gap, there's an 18 year age gap between Whitney and her husband. No judgment there. I don't give a shit. Love is love. If you're 45 and, you know, 25 and you're both consenting adults, then. Yeah. So long as you were adults the whole time. Yeah. Who shit. cares? So they are now married. They have two kids together. I don't remember. I think honestly. I get confused. Obviously, he has older kids and they have younger kids between the two of them. I think they have two, maybe three. I don't remember. There's a lot of kids on the show, so I get them all mixed up. But they do have kids together. Um. And so they've been married for, I don't know if I wrote down. They've been married for a while now. I didn't write down how long. It was the 10 year. Oh, they did their 10 year anniversary, right? Yeah, their uh, vow renewal. So both families said First they weren't going to last because, you know, they both had affairs with each other and those relationships tend to not last, which generally is not entirely true. And so they've been together for a while now. Um, because of the situation with being married to other people and having an affair and being Mormon, they were both excommunicated from the church, which is not, not typical for Mormonism. Um, when you're married in the temple and make temple covenants and you commit to each other for eternity, part of the covenants that you make in the temple is that you're only going to be committed to each other and there is no sexual or emotional affairs happening outside yeah. of your marriage and so they broke a temple covenant which is a really big deal yeah the law of chastity when you make that covenant because it's a commandment that you're supposed to live by even just to get baptized right mm -hmm. but it's one of the explicit the express covenants in the temple that you're not supposed to break you're not supposed to have sexual relations with anyone outside of your heterosexual partner who you're legally and lawfully married to. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we were just talking about in the lapis last episode with uh, the miracle of forgiveness, the fornication and adultery chapter is called the sin next to murder. It is so fucking serious for them. It is. And so it's not surprising to me that they're, that they got excommunicated is there people who have affairs who don't get excommunicated for sure is there a lot of people who have affairs and do get excommunicated totally so it is not bizarre or strange in any way that they were both excommunicated from the church so that's the two of them the other dynamic um with whitney is that her dad has a substance use disorder he is um, addicted to prescription pain pills. And so a lot of the first season is her relationship with her father and her, you know, interacting and trying to support him. And so I wanted to bring that up because prescription painkillers, opioid addiction in Utah is like outrageous. Like it is outrageous. Yeah. It is like basically a joke here now that every white suburban Mormon Stanley Cup owning mom pops Xanax like on the regular pops pills on the regular yeah so it's like it's just like the thing here because people are like people don't use drugs in Utah and I'm like no people in Utah use the expensive prescription drugs yeah. is what they use they just don't talk about it and it's very well hidden because I mean when you have that first interview with your bishop and he's asking you if you participate in self-care and if you live the word of wisdom and things like that you either are or you lie mm -hmm. or you confess to it and you feel like shit he tells you that you need to not take the sacrament and participate in some capacity in church meetings and things like that so i mean the options when you aren't living in the the commandments are uh, pretty slim and one seems a lot better than the other in yeah. a lot of cases. So people learn to lie and they hide their addictions and things like that. I mean, most or both of us know family members and family friends here in Utah that struggle with this like severely and have for decades in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. So it's there. It's just hidden. Or well, even, well. even in my experience in college, um, like 
the whole kind of culture around drug use in colleges and at colleges is it's like, and I mean, I went to a rich people school and I have the debt to prove it, um, <laughs> is that it's not like... Thank you, Joe Brandon. It's <laughs> it's rich people drugs. It's not weed in the basement. It's, you know, you're more expensive to find like pills. It's out of mommy yeah. and daddy's pill cabinet it's and you know that's not something that's generally unique to utah but in my experience a lot of the time it was not like the cheaper if you will drugs and more common it was the like harder to find more expensive things that you know frat boys would be pulling out of their mom's pill cabinet yeah so it is just kind of bizarre culturally that there's it's less like gateway drug (laughs) of weed which is not just shut the up and more like pills which is just interesting well and and those prescription drugs obviously in a lot of cases if you can't afford to support the habit you get hooked because you had a an operation or something a lot of people turn to other street forms of the same drugs so it's it's really bad here. We definitely encourage anyone who lives in Utah or anywhere really to carry Narcan just to give someone a check, a second chance. For real. So we'll talk about that more in our season one video, but that's Winnie. And then last, but certainly not least, we have Mary. <laughs> so Mary is an interesting character. Um, I will say, Utah is not generally diverse. (laughs) In fact, um, there was even a book written about a Utah city way down south called St. George. And it was a book like whitest cities in America because the (laughs) St. George is like 99% white. Um, And so Utah by and large is a very white state. Um, And so you don't find a lot of people of color. You don't find a lot of diversity just in general. And so there's a lot of racism like a lot of those things. So the fact that they have two women of color on this show, I was yeah. actually like very pleasantly surprised. I mean, bare yeah. ass minimum, but still nonetheless. Mary is a black woman. She is the first lady of her church. So she is Pentecostal. So like I said, we've got a wide gamut of religions on the show, yeah. which I really appreciate because I thought it was just going to be like Mormon city. So I actually am glad that they had some variation. So the controversy with Mary is that she is married to her step-grandfather. Very controversial, okay? Obviously. They are not biological. It is a step-grandfather. But her grandmother was married, obviously, to her grandfather. Not her grandfather, her step Her step-grandfather. Yeah. And... She told Mary, essentially, or she told her husband that if anything ever happened to me, I want you to marry one of my girls because then I know you'll always be taken care of. So there was some, you know, fighting between Mary and her mother, but Mary ended up being the one that married her step-grandfather. And so Mary took over as first lady of the church because Mary's grandmother was first lady of the church. And so Mary... Was that the title that she claimed? First Lady? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Her grandmother, too? Mm-hmm. Hmm. I, is that, like, a common thing? I... Because what I was thinking, if it was just Mary, it, feel, it felt like she just claimed that title as, like, a way to distance herself from the idea of clergy. Maybe. Because there know. is... I mean, there's some distasteful things in the media surrounding clergy and things of that nature. So, I don't know. But I guess if her grandma did it, too, then... I think so. That was my understanding anyway. There you go. So her church is called Faith Temple. It's in Salt Lake. And it was, she got everything. She inherited everything from her grandmother. And so her grandmother was what it sounds like a very wealthy woman. Um, And she inherited a lot of money. Um, At one point during the show, she's asked how many like properties she owns and she can't even give a number. money money 
like big money. And so in her home, oh my Lord, it is like, to me, it's nauseating. Like she and her husband have been married for 21 years. They have one kid together who's a teenager. I think he's, by this point, he's probably graduated from high school. Yeah. And so like there's three of them. Her husband travels constantly. So he's not even there half the time. So generally the only person in the house is her and then if her son's there but he might have moved out i haven't watched season three yet but like their house is ridiculous it is like a mansion it is insane and for one person to be living in a house that size it is just like come on like it's not necessary in my opinion but it is because she has a shit ton of clothes and she loves designer clothes and shoes and everything like that which oh yeah no shade if you like stuff like that that's that's fine with you you want to look how you want to look and all that stuff but holy shit this she has crazy amounts of clothes (laughs) yeah so she describes the marriage to her step-grandfather is like what was dictated to her almost like out of her grandmother's will so it almost comes off as like very arranged marriage yeah but then more light gets shed on that later on in the season and it's a little muddier than that at least in my opinion and so mary is the other pot stirrer um she is rich person elite like it is elitism one percent at its finest for sure um and so she comes off very snobby yeah very bitchy Kenneth copland kind of vibes not creepy like kenneth copland but prosperity gospel yeah for sure um and so she's very obnoxious and so she stirs the pot much like jen and lisa do and jen and mary have this like whole thing for all of season one which we'll get into but mary is very much a pot stirrer too very just kind of rude and snarky um and very like everybody's beneath me yeah and lisa has those vibes too um they're similar in that way so that's mary um so those are the ones we've got jen heather meredith lisa whitney and mary um they're the main characters husbands are involved and there's some like outside friends and kids and stuff but primarily it's it's them those are the personalities those are the gals and so the gals those are the gals these are the the gal pals these are what we're going to be working with so if you do not watch the show or you're not going to and you're just going to listen to our synopsis this is a starting point for you to reference back to as we go through um the other seasons so that you have a starting point and an understanding of who and what we're talking about so that is the gist of all of them yeah like we said, there's like a lot of stuff that has to do with Mormonism and not even the just the one. Well, Lisa's the only one who's proclaiming Mormonism to the extreme. And in the first season, at least Heather's kind of on the, her way out. But like it's all they talk about it in every single episode. It talk in some capacity or mm-hmm. another it comes up. where they're talking about how it's influenced them in their lives. If they were Mormon at any point or how uh, they're using it at, to explain the culture of the area to the people who aren't Mormon. Yep. So it's kind of interesting how even though some of them never were Mormon, it affects their lives in some way, shape, or form, which, I mean, they live in the state of Utah. And the legislature here, it it is basically a theocracy. For all intents and purposes, a lot of the people who are in the legislature have sworn to dedicate their time and talents and money to the building up, not of the kingdom of God, but to the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, bar none so when they're governing our state you don't think that wouldn't inform their decisions when they're doing things so even if they're i mean just being here it's influencing some part of your lives in some way shape or form so it's a big thing you should just die close it and open it that's weird 
That was weird. <laughs> okay. So it's just interesting to see uh, this kind of stuff be put kind of in center stage uh, because there's not really much going on in the media with the the culture of Utah. And I don't want to hear in the comments that, oh, it's a difference of the church and the culture is different. Like, bro, these people have lived here their entire lives. What made them so awful? What's the common thread that made everybody so awful? <laughs> and they're not all awful, but it does highlight some of the things that are just really toxic within Mormon culture. Absolutely. And where does, where's that going to come from if it, that's the one common thread with everybody? Yeah. So. Anyway. What do you think? How was that? Was this enough information? Are we ready for the part, the next part? The analysis of season one. Will I ever find a point to what I'm saying? <laughs> Likely not. I'm just saying, I'm just trying to get to the end <laughs> in a way that makes sense. So we're going for it. Okay. So that's them. Our next video in this series will be the synopsis of season one and going over season one. Um, Season two will probably be split into two episodes just because there's like 24 episodes in the whole season. It's a big boy. It's a big boy. And then we'll get on to season three. So that is the end for today. Look at you. You're floundering now. Now <laughs> I'm floundering. I don't even know where to go from here. Why am I struggling so much? I don't know. I'm hot, so I'm trying to get it out of this, in this sweatshirt. So thank you to all of you who made it this far. We appreciate you. If this is something that you like to hear more of, you can hit the subscribe button down below. Hit the or button. Or download our podcast so that you get updates in the future, uh, whatever p platform you're on, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, whatever. We love the support. We appreciate every single person who follows us. It helps us keep doing what we're doing, so you're awesome. If you want to go a step farther, you can go to the link down in the description and join our Patreon, or if you're watching on YouTube, you can go just down below next to the, where the little subscribe button is that you just hit. You can become a member of the channel. Same thing, you get the same perks. Here on YouTube, it's got the better integration, so you get a little badge when you're in the comments, when you're in our live streams and stuff like that. So check that out. If you'd like to follow along for more content, then we have our Instagram and we have a bunch of stuff, old stuff on our TikTok. You can go over there. You can find us on both of those platforms at Jordan and McKay. It's pretty awesome. Jordan is on Instagram basically every day. So check out there for updates periodically of what's going on with us. You can also hop into our discord it's an awesome community full of former mormons and never mormons and just a, a whole bunch of different people and perspectives and it's fun there's a lot of different topics and things that you can participate in so check us out there you can find the link down in the description below us so that does it for today's episode thank you everybody for joining us for this unhinged little intro to the real housewives of salt lake city we appreciate you we love you and we will see you next time <laughs>